Chef Gruel. It was Jimmy, he messed up. So you just missed it. We made one of my ancient family recipes, green eggs and ham. And I just wanna show you this. I use extra green sauce. And it's, it's mm -hmm. almost, it almost, it adds such a good flavor to it. Let me, this is how I eat it. Mm, mm -hmm -hmm. So good, Chef Gruel. So which food dye is your favorite color? Uh, I'm, you know, I'm open anywhere between like food dye 10 all the way up to 1400. Yeah, we love red 40. That's my favorite. I love red 40. I put it in my Pepsi. I put it in everything. But we're going to let, uh, what we're going to do is we're making you a special Ukrainian style egg. Have you ever seen this done before, Chef Girl? Is, now we're just going to mix the yellow in there. Oh, that's beautiful. Yes. That's beautiful. Yeah, it's going to be I'm Vladimir Zelensky approved. Okay, now that we got you, now we can start the normal interview. Chef, Super Chef Andrew Gruel, I know that you at one point were a food judge and you got, uh, I wouldn't say you got canceled though, right? Or did you get canceled, Chef? I got a little canceled, a little canceled here, a little canceled there, but I'm back. If you're not getting canceled, you're not doing anything right. But you may not know that at one point I was trained by Super Chef Bobby Flay. Can we show that graphic? Yep, pulling it up right about Should be. now. Now you see this, Chef Gruel. Have you ever met Super Chef Bobby Flay? Uh, I think briefly in passing, but nothing, you know, we don't, we've, I've never uh, laid down with him. Well, I've laid down with him a lot. We slept together in that kitchen, not sexually, metaphorically laid down a lot of food in that kitchen. And let me just tell this quick story, and I told this on the air before, even though we're supposed to be interviewing you, I want to let you talk, but he taught me a, a very, very important lesson, and I got to give you the Cliff Notes version. I got eliminated from a show called Worst Cooks in America, where he teaches bad cooks how to cook. I got eliminated a little too early. I went to the media, they interviewed me, and I complained, and I made fun of, I made fun of Bobby Flay. I got a cease and desist from the Food Network. They said, do not talk negative. You know, you're on his team. It basically proves that you lost, so it, you know, it ruins the show. If you do this, you could face legal ramifications. And they said, they even to add to injury to insult, they're like, and Chef Bobby Flay's really disappointed. He actually liked you, Alex. Even though he kicked me off the show, so you know, it's kind of how much did he really like me? But fast forward two years, I'm like, the show's over. I'm not even thinking, not even in two years, one year. I, fast forward, yeah, I'm not even thinking about the show. My dad calls me from North Park Mall. He said, get to Williams Sonoma right now. I think he's like in an accident. That's in North Park. It's like a few miles from my house. I drive straight there. There's a line around the door, Williams Sonoma. I'm like, dad, what the hell's going on? It's a Bobby Flay autograph session for his newest cookbook. This is a true story. And my dad said, Alex, I want you to go introduce me to Bobby Flay. Andrew, I was scared. I was like, oh my God, he's going to act like he doesn't know me. He's going to maybe, you know, just totally ignore me is what I thought. I thought he's going to be like, who are you? And I'm there with my dad, even though I was on the show with him for a month. Well, he was so nice and so gracious, Chef. He made me feel this big because he killed me with kindness. And that's when I learned. It's like when you're big like that and people come after you, the best way to get back at somebody is with kindness than being rude. So I just, that's my Bobby Flay story. Do you have one? I like that. I like that. I don't have a Bobby Flay story, but I understand how it's what it's like to be made to feel small. That's why I'm that's why I'm short. I was six, eight when I started in this industry. So uh, that that's a nice story, though. That's a heartwarming story. But how'd you do on the show? I got like, kicked did off. You this is and this is why I got kicked off, chef, because he Bobby Flay just I hate to say, admit this too. During the casting process, looking for bad cooks. I'm not a great cook. I'm not like a cook chef like you. But I mean, I can I can turn on an oven. Everybody else on the show is like, they're like, what's an oven? You know, like literally, that's how, you know, like like they only thought a microwave existed, right? They didn't even know how to start a gas stove. Like, I at least know how to start a gas stove. You know, I mean, I, I don't know how to cook that well, but I, I know like the bare minimum, the basics. These people that are on the show had no idea. So during the casting process, like, oh man, I really want to get on it. Cause it's like a trip to New York. You stay there for a month. You live there, and it was, you know, it was popular. It was like on the third season, so it was just I wanted to get on it. So when I was chopping an onion, I purposely cut my finger, and I spilled blood everywhere. And I, I got a call that next day and said, "You're casted for the show." Yeah, yeah, it's always good to cut off a finger. I, you know, I'm not even kidding. I mean, I just nicked it, and they loved it. They were dying laughing when I was bleeding. And I'm like, "Is there a towel?" And there's blood everywhere. They loved it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they put you up in a nice suite or no? Well, no, they put us in a rinky-dink hotel and then we lived in a house with all these guys. And I had a guy, Dr. Bob, who had a CPAP machine. Him and I were bunk mates. We lived in uh, Brooklyn, Williamsburg in a like um, townhouse, right? It had like four floors. And so a CPAP machine all night. <laughs> so I couldn't sleep at all. And uh, yeah, and we were competing to win like, you know, $25,000, I think the price was. But 
I learned a lot from Chef Bobby Flay. I learned, though, that, you know, cooking's hard. So why do you, why do you have such a passion for the culinary arts, Chef? Oh, man. Look, it's, 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 I get to see hundreds and hundreds of guests every single day. It's a band of pirates in the kitchen. First of all, I'm absolutely crazy. Uh, not <laughs> on a level like, you're, you know, you're, you know, there's intelligence is just the same thing as crazy. So you understand this. But the uh, kitchen is a band of pirates. I mean, it's just a bunch of outcasts who realize that the only place that they can shine is in the kitchen. That's how I ended up there. And, you know, being who I am, trying to be the best at everything, I decided I would excel. But you got people in this industry who are struggling actors. You got people who are working a nine to five job and just need a little extra spending money. You got the housewife. You've got the young entry level worker. You've got everybody in this industry. And in that six hour period, that four hour period, however long services, everybody's on the same page. So there's no other industry in which you can pull people together like that except jail. <laughs> wow. And they have to cook in jail. Well, why do you why do you stand apart from other chefs, Chef Andrew? Uh, well, number one, because I, uh, you know, go on shows like yours. Yeah, uh, well, you're two, famous. I mean, but I'm saying, well, you know, I guess culinarily, why do you stand out? Honestly, uh, because I treat my workers well. And I know that that's a huge kind of marching marching uh, orders from the left is like pro worker, pro worker. But the thing is, I'm like a free market pro worker guy. So I've always been close with my team members, close with my workers. And that's got, garnered me a lot of attention during the pandemic. When everything got shut down, we raised almost a million dollars specifically for restaurant workers that were getting screwed by the government. And now you got the government coming around and they're like, the hell with the small business owners. We're the ones that you guys should be looking up to as your savior. Um, you know, people stay and work with me for De you know, over a decade because because of that, we're a family. And then from a culinary perspective, man, food is easy. You know this. If you were on the Bobby Flay show, it's not that difficult. All you need is a little bit of green dye 40, salt, pepper, <laughs> and some paprika. And, uh, and as long as your ingredients are high quality, then you're going to keep getting guests back. Yeah, but you know this. The restaurant business is the hardest business. So tell me something about your failures in the restaurant business, Chef. Oh, man. I mean, you know, nine to What's your nine biggest to horror sto restaurant horror story in the business aspect of it? I got two, right? So the first one is probably I was working for the Grand Teton Lodge Company, and uh, you know we were in a kitchen, and this these two guys were fighting. You had the one grill guy, and then you had the one pantry guy, and they were so mad. They were from different parts of Mexico, and they probably had some bad blood from a gang perspective. And Wait, so I you're was telling just me that they had car you think they might have had bad blood because of the cartel or whatever? I mean, that's just deep. Yeah. Wow. No, wow. no, trust me, they they hated each other. And one day the guy finished making all of his salads and the grill guys weeded now, right? Because when the salad guy makes all of his stuff, he's done. Then it goes to the main entree, the main course. So he was taunting him, right? Like, ah, oh, you look pretty busy. Looks like you're in the weeds. So he's leaning over into this guy's station. He's like, if you cross the line on that station one more time, I'm going to do something you're not going to like. And I'm in the middle of this and I'm like, come on, man. No, don't, don't do it, man. I'm just, I just need to get paid. So the guy puts his hand on his cutting board, crossing that, you know, that line and the grill guy just takes his knife and just jams it right through the guy's hand. No, he and didn't. I'm, and this is at the Grand Teton. Oh, this is at a nice hotel. This, this is a. Oh, this, well, this, this was when I was out west working for that company. I'm not going to name where I was yeah, working that's specifically. Fine. This was outside of that. Uh, you know, because ever ever since the accident, I got to keep my mouth shut. But the uh, so the guy stabs the knife through the other guy's hand and. I don't know what to do here, right? So I just keep dropping chicken parm because no. we got open out the door. Wait, so this guy's bleeding and you're still frying, deep frying chicken parm? <laughs> Shut up. Hey, you know what? I didn't know that I was going to get stabbed in the middle of all this. Maybe I'm collateral damage. <laughs> so, you know, this guy's screaming at the top of his lung. There's blood over the all over the cutting board. I'm dropping chicken parms left and right, you know, and I'm covered head to toe in egg batter. And, uh, you know, ultimately they shut everything down. You know, police come take this guy out. I have to clean everything up. So that's my first story. My second story was when I was cooking online. And uh, this was actually in the same general time frame. My fry cook shits his pants in the middle of service. So <laughs> they're done that. You know. <laughs> hell, I, hell, that might have been me in a past life. So he, yeah. he, he takes a number yeah, two a, during the middle yeah, of the it was service. A, Middle of service. It was like an oops, oops, I crap my pants moment. And <laughs> Joe Biden vibes. I'm, but this guy doesn't want to do anything about it. So he just keeps cooking. And I'm like, look, guys, something's going on here. Like, Wait, I don't know. Time whether out. Chef Gruel, you're telling me that this guy didn't want to run to the bathroom. He's like, no, I still got to throw this meat on the grill. That's disgusting. I, I don't know whether he thought it was just like a light squirt or what it was. But in any case, the guy craps, him, craps himself. And I'm like, we somebody who opened steaks or something going on. We can't serve the food. Something stinks. Nothing is right here. Mind you, I'm just a young 
I'm a young line cook. So ultimately he's like, ah, oh, you know what? I, I, I crap my pants and just walks off line like nothing happened. Um, and you know, I'm just dumping bleach all over the place. So look, it's a crazy industry, man. You know, <laughs> yeah, and I'd say so. You got people stabbing each other. You got people, you know, crapping their pants. So call me nuts. I'm, you know, I'm the, I'm the head of the pirate ship. You really are. You are a modern day pirate. Tell me this. What's the deal with that Wagyu? Everything's called Wagyu now. That's a big scam. How can they just call everything Wagyu? Yeah, it is. It is a scam. I mean, look, at the end of the day, this all stems from this Japanese beef where they would actually feed it a lot of beer and sake and a ton of grain and they would massage it so that the beef, the fat was supposed to get into the muscle. And everybody loved that. So then there's iterations of this type of beef in America. Now they call it Wagyu. It's really highly marbled. I don't you know, I've cooked it. It's fatty. It's great. You know, maybe have one ounce of it, but I wouldn't pay $80 a pound for it. I, uh, Especially if you ever see a Wagyu burger on a menu, yeah, don't buy it because the fat's inside the meat. If you're grinding it up, why are you paying all the money for the fat that's now just ground up in the meat? Yeah, no, that makes sense. It's kind of redundant. Oh, it, Alex, can I ask? Can I ask? Yes, Jeff Girl? Jimmy. Even though you messed up the interview and you didn't let his audio work, yes, you yes, can ask yes, a question. Yes, even exactly. though you're probably so. Last so I don't know if you know here. this, but I am a connoisseur of edible bugs, and so okay. oh, this is real. real. This no, is no, real. Real. I actually like these are the bugs. I ate it as a bit one time, but I actually love it. So I was just wondering if you would ever consider using edible bugs at your restaurants. No, I wouldn't. I'll tell you why. Is because it's only a matter of time before somebody. Most people don't know they're allergic to bugs. So bugs are in the same family as shrimp. So you got to figure, right? Like somebody's got a, a, a shellfish allergy or a crustacean allergy. They know it because they almost died once. Bugs, as an anachronoid, people people are allergic to that, but they don't know it because they don't eat it. So one day, what's going to happen is a restaurant's going to think they're all avant garde. They're going to serve bugs. They're not going to put it on the menu. Somebody's going to choke, almost die, or die, and then everybody's going to start getting sued. That's why I don't serve bugs. I'm suing Jimmy because he fat shames me, and that's smart that you don't uh, uh, serve bugs. What is the worst uh, allergic reaction you've ever had in a restaurant? Have you had a bad one with a, with a customer? Yeah we've, had, yeah, we've had shellfish allergies. Um, uh, we, we Actually, you know what? I'll tell you another one. So we had a lady come into our restaurant once. First time I, I opened, right? So I started Slapfish as a food truck back in 2011 and then grew it to 35 locations, sold it a couple of years ago. And it was our first brick and mortar location. I only had a couple employees and were slammed one day. And this lady comes in, must have been allergic to something that she ate and she craps herself. I know I keep telling these stories. That's about a lot. There, there's a lot of people pooping their pants. Chef. What's going on? So, hey. she, so she's, a, she's a patron at your restaurant eating she's the shellfish. Patron. She runs into the restroom, locks herself. She's in like a business meeting. This lady's wearing like a business suit. She runs into the restroom, locks herself in the restroom, tries to kind of clean it up, get some of it in the sink, and then she runs out of the restaurant. But because of the smell, we ended up having to close the restaurant. <laughs> and I go and I, so I, I what, one of the guys who's kind of helping like utility washing dishes, et cetera, I didn't ask him to do this. I would have gone in and cleaned it myself. He goes into the restroom to clean it up and it smells so bad. And he sees the turds in the sink that he throws up. So then he comes out, he comes out of the bathroom, he's throwing up, and then somebody else comes who's working for us, goes and sees him throw up. It's the cliched chain reaction throwing up. So yeah, now I, I end up having to close for like two hours, sanitize everything, clean everything. I got staff now that left because they're throwing up because there was a turd in the sink. This poor lady locked herself in the bathroom. So I'm assuming she was allergic to something. I don't know what, uh, but... Yeah, you know, this is a dangerous business, man. Dangerous I know. business. She's just crapping her pants like that. Wow, that is insane. Okay, wait, chef. Now we want to show you. We made this. Come on, Nate. Let's bring the camera over here so we can show. This is our latest creation in support of the war in Ukraine. Brandon, can you tell them a little bit about this recipe? Yeah, so we have a little taki garnish here with some blue egg substitute and a little yellow with a hint of green. Uh, substitute for all the money we're laundering. And do you like to use, is liquid egg substitute, this is a lot healthier, right? Because it's a substitute? <laughs> yeah, oh, the health, the substitute teacher is always healthier, right? That's what I'm saying. That substitute teacher is fun. You watch Bill Nye the Science Guy. Okay, uh, let's try a little bit of this. This is for you, Vladimir Zelensky. Oh, hey, will you put... Uh, but, but here's the thing. You're being really diplomatic because with the red, the blue, and the white, 
you know, you're moving into Russian territory there. Oh, Vladimir Putin, we're going to get canceled now, even though uh, Vladimir Putin, we do agree with a lot of his stuff, especially Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy loves Vladimir Putin. But hey, listen, I don't like to, I don't like to eat alone. I like to eat with, uh, you know, when you eat, it's always better to eat with somebody you love. So Brandon, can you hold this over your face while I eat this like we're on a date? So this is my favorite Big Booty Latina AOC. Hello, AOC. Thank you for cooking me this delicious food after a hard day at work, honey. Oh, you're welcome, Alex. Oh, I can't wait to eat this. Oh, I love you so much, AOC. Oh, I slaved away over all day. Oh, thank you for just, you know, not focusing on Congress and focusing on your hubby. Mm, I love you, baby. Mm. Mm. Oh, I'm glad you like it. Mm. Mm. So what'd you do at work today, hon? Uh, you know, nothing really. Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah, Did just... you see John Fetterman? Uh, yeah. Was yeah, that... you know, he's still retarded. Okay, good. All right, well, this is how we role play. It's still... This is actually pretty good. The blue dye... Tastes a little better than the red. Have you heard that one, Chef? I don't know. Is this sweet? I don't. I don't do the dyes, man. But I would if I was there with you. It's very well, sour. Think, very sour. We need to do a cooking demo together. There, you know, you and I, in our bathing suits. Tuck friendly. Remember, tuck friendly. Yeah. That's me. Tuck friendly. Yeah. If you can't tuck it, if you can't cook. If you can't tuck, you can't cook. That's my one rule. I don't want anybody to have their genitals near the kitchen. I want you guys all tucked. Uh, AOC's tucking right now, right? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. You always have to stay tucked at the kitchen. Okay, but Chef, wait, what is this recipe? This looks scary. We're doing a little purple eggs here, you know? <laughs> we might as well get the full color spectrum. But what is the what is the white in there? That looks like... Well, some of the egg substitute doesn't mix terribly good. Oh yeah. my gosh. AOC I, made this. So. This has Venom vibes. Okay, let's get back to Chef. So, Chef, before we let you go, we only got you for a few more minutes. Tell me this, though, when it comes to the world we're living in today, how can you help with food? I'm saying, you know, you're such a popular guy. I guess what is your... My goal is to, like, wake people up to the hypocrisy and stuff. Do I always achieve that goal? No, but, like, what is your goal? Because I think you're more than a chef. Yeah, so look, I think that part of the reason why there's so much division is because a lot of, a lot of the left, they actually don't even understand the idea behind the things that they're supporting, right? So when I use, I, I use food as a conversation piece to get the left to understand why smaller government is important. So anytime you're in a debate with somebody from the left, just break it down to food. They're the same people that wanna buy from the local farmer's markets. They're all granola crunchy hippies. They don't want the government to be able to ban them from buying the raw milk cheese that they love from their favorite French bistro. Well, guess what? The government is the one who's coming in and putting the Amish farmers in handcuffs for serving raw milk. The government and the overregulation of our food system is what's leading to the Western diet, which is killing millions of people, which is why they're saying we need universal health care. So if you start with the food, we can actually fix all of our problems and be one happy, unified country if we decentralize the food system, if we use food as the means by which you can introduce some region, reason and logic to the left and we all eat together, it's a beautiful thing. No, and you're exactly right, because during Occupy Wall Street, all the people that were five times vaccinated and wanted to close down, those guys were anti-establishment. They were anti-banks. And then come, you know, 2020, all of a sudden, all of those same people that you would think that they would align with a lot of the people that were pro chore or, you know, anti-mask. I'm just saying you would have thought that they would be against the big government, but that's, that's the opposite. Like, it's very weird how uh, the hypocrisy yeah. that people have in their own viewpoints. Well, use the use the school system, right? They want big government running the school system and all the food that they're feeding those kids are junk. So you should have local chefs. You should have a local decentralized, unregulated food system feeding these kids. But they want the government to be able to control all of that. So they have the money. So you just have to ask them, be like, do you want these kids eating crap? Do you support Tyson? Do you support these massive food manufacturers? No, we don't. Well, guess what? That's who the government's partnering with. So government is it's corporatism. So you got to think small government if you support the kids. Okay, now we got a couple uh, tough questions we ask everybody. But first tough question is not the normal one we ask. Did you know that in Pepsi and in like a lot of Frito-Lay products were derived from aborted fetal cells? I didn't know that. You didn't Did know not. that. Yes, you got to no. Google that. Look that up. Even Pepsi was, uh, was derived from, I don't know why aborted fetal cells would be needed, but I've always thought that's very weird. Okay, now we're going to ask you the tough questions. Okay, yeah. first question, Chef. Was 9-11 an inside job? Yeah, I mean, I think that the government knows a lot more than they might tell us, but I wouldn't say it's an inside job. Okay, that's a diplomatic answer. Now, now the next one, 
Answer this for real, because I know you're in the kitchen. I know you're with a bunch of guys. You, you know, Javier and Pablo, they're out there puffing joints and probably watching YouTube videos about the ice wall. And they probably told you all about this, but the moon landing, 1969 through 1972, real or fake? Uh, you know what? Uh, I'm, I, I plead the fifth on that one only ah, because... He's been talking to the kitchen. You know it's fake, right? Oh, I, the reason I plead the fifth is because my kids see this. We've we've been talking about this every night before I go to bed, and I'm in the process of a big series of nighttime stories. Mm -hmm. And my answer could give away the ending. So, knowing this is a kids show that you host, it is. I, I can't go there yet. Call okay. me back in a month. Yes, sir. I will. And you're going to come in studio. And we're going to actually do a proper cooking demonstration. We're going to have you on all the shows because, as chef, I, you know, I said, oh, Andrew Grill's coming on. Sarah Gonzalez. Everybody's like, oh, we want to get him on our show. And so, you know, the, you're really beloved here. Okay, now, last question. Is the earth round or flat like a pancake or pizza? Uh, I actually firmly believe that the earth is more like a hexagon. Okay, well, I'll take it. And that, I got one to say here. Well, oh, yeah, ask, please, Brandon. Yeah. He's uh, very big on vibrational energy, and he believes that the slaughterhouses are making the meat uh, bad for you. Oh, let me guys. tell that. Let me explain this. Now, Go Chef, now it. you have to expose me. I didn't even want to admit this because Chef Andrew, he's a popular guy. He's, I don't want him to know my true being. Chef, you're not going to believe this, but I am a vegetarian. I eat eggs, obviously. I'm not vegan. I'm not even close to vegan, but I don't eat meat. Why, you ask? Because I watch those documentary Game Changers. I watch all these documentaries. But then the real reason, the real reason, the reason that put me over the edge, because I... I stopped eating meat. I kind of slowly, you know, phase it out. Hillary Clinton supposedly, supposedly drinks the blood of children called adrenochrome. It's supposed. I'm not saying she does it. That's a conspiracy. I don't even necessarily believe it. But adrenalized blood is real. And when the cows are factory farmed and they're slaughtered, that they do release adrenaline. So when I talk about vibrational energy, because you said woo woo, I'm very woo woo, that when the other cow sees its other friend die and you eat that meat and you go to McDonald's and one hamburger will have meat from a thousand different cows that were all mm -hmm. killed in a very sad way watching all their friends die, I think that meat is low vibrational. Now you kill a deer, that's great. I think that's high vibrational meat, right? Or like if it's farmed right. Am I uh, am I homosexual? No, I, so, so, <laughs> so, so I actually don't think that's many steps from woo woo to reality. I think you're closer than you than you know you are because the inhumane harvest and slaughter of meat actually creates a horrible product. It's awful for just like in general, the psyche of the environment. I firmly believe that we need to change the way in which we harvest meat, produce meat in this country. Um, and when we do so, we're actually going to see a massive change in whether you want to call it kind of the vibration or the, the you know, the, the moral compass of America by way of the meat. No, you're right. And, and like I said, I'm not against meat. I have dogs. I have cats. I think we got to have meat. I, I'm saying I'm just a little woo woo. But I think that if we killed animals and I'm not even saying the kosher way, but like if you hunt a deer and you eat it, that tastes even better. Right. Or you catch a fish, you eat it. It tastes better. So. I don't know how we're going to do that. I think we, you know, we need food for people, so we're never going to stop factory farming. I'm not one of those PETA freaks that want to stop that. But I do think our mental health and stuff would be better if we ate better food. And I think that's... Uh, you can you can actually stop... Fa we can stop factory farming. We can start supporting local farms and allow and deregulating the system so that you can do it on a local level and sell within a local community. And then, you, you know, there's not all this interstate commerce stuff. The government highly regulates it. Let me tell you something really quickly. Yeah. The book, The Jungle by Upton Sinclair, which created like all of these regulations, was written by the largest meat packers and producers in order to create the regulations to push the small guys out so that they could centralize it. And, and they merged with the government. And that's why our food system is so disgusting and why people are getting so sick. Wow, it's the, I mean, that is fascism. When I mean, it's like, you know, these corporate states, they, they, kill, they kill all the small business owners that would actually, you know, probably make good food and good meat to just sell us this Monsanto genetically modified crap. Okay, I guess yeah. I actually one last question. Everybody dogs McDonald's. I love the fries at McDonald's. We know <laughs> it's not healthy, but are you, you're a chef. Do you ever go get a Big Mac? Do you ever go get a, a you know, a burger from McDonald's? I get the fries. The fries are the per the best fries in the industry, and here's why. And I just did a post about this. McDonald's boils their fries with a little bit of acidulated water first, then they flash freeze them, and then they fry them to order. So the you by boiling them, you actually don't make them greasy and heavy. You par cook them. The acid prevents the pectin from breaking down, and when you freeze them, the ice crystals 
are what creates that blisteringly crisp exterior on the fry. They've mastered it. They have mastered it. Even though they use chemicals to, you know, on the potatoes that I think the farmers have to stay away for like 30 days or something, but they sure as hell are delicious in that sweet and sour sauce. Chef, before you go, how can the people find you and support you? Uh, follow me on Twitter at, or X. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. Follow me on X at Gruel. Follow me on Instagram at Andrew Gruel. You can find me on YouTube. I don't do too much on there, but at Andrew Gruel. Um, and then you can, uh, you know, Find me on OnlyPans at uh, Andrew Gruel. I love it, OnlyPans. This guy's a freaking genius. All right, Chef, we're going to talk to you soon. And I'm sorry about the technical difficulties. Jimmy's going to be fired when you come in studio, so you won't have to see him. So say goodbye to oh, Say goodbye bye, to Jimmy. Bye, bye. It was wonderful. My last show with you, the legendary show. Appreciate ever. it. Th yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Chef. Keep up the good work. I'm so fly, I'm aligned with the planes. My grind's so refined, I got no time for no games. Ask yourself 